Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Tuesday, September the 22nd. Today is the day the Church commemorates the life of Jonah. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Our New Testament reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 5. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as, as sisters, in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day, but she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an, unbelie an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than sixty years of age, having been the wife of one husband, and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened, so that it may care for those who are truly widows. And we will read oh, about Jonah. Uh, about Jonah. A singular prophet among the many in the Old Testament, Jonah, the son of Amittai, was born about an hour's walk from the town of Nazareth. The focus of his prophetic ministry was the call to preach at Nineveh, the captain, capital of pagan Assyria. His reluctance to respond and God's insistence that he, call, that he heed his call is the story of the book that bears Jonah's name. Although the swallowing and disengorging this gorging of Jonah by the great fish is the most remembered detail of his life. It is addressed in only three verses of the book. Throughout the book, the important theme is how God deals compassionately with sinners. Jonah's three-day sojourn in the belly of the fish is mentioned by Jesus as a sign of his own death, burial, and resurrection. And we continue with our reading of Article 5 of the Apology, beginning in paragraph 227. Here again, the adversaries will cry out that there is no need of good works if they do not merit eternal life. These lies we have refuted above. Of course, it is necessary to do good works. We say that eternal life has been promised to the justified, but those who walk according to the flesh retain neither faith nor righteousness. For this very reason, we are justified. Being righteous, we may begin to do good works and to obey God's law. 
We are regenerated and receive the Holy Spirit for the very reason that the new life may produce new works, new dispositions, the fear and love of God, hatred of lustful desires, concupiscence, and so on. This faith arises in repentance and should be established and grow amid good works, temptations, and dangers. This is so we may continually be more firmly persuaded that God cares for us, forgives us, and hears us for Christ's sake. This is not learned without many and great struggles. How often is conscience aroused? How often does it awaken even to despair when it shows either old or new sins or the impurity of our nature? This handwriting is not blotted out without a great struggle. Experience testifies what a difficult matter faith is, while we are encouraged in the midst of the terrors and receive comfort, other spiritual movements grow at the same time, knowledge of God, fear of God, hope and love of God. We are renewed, as St. Paul says, in knowledge after the image of its creator, Colossians 3.10, and beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image, 2 Corinthians 3.18. In other words, we receive the true knowledge of God so that we truly fear him, we truly trust that we are cared for by him, and that we are heard by him. This regeneration is the beginning of eternal life, as Paul says. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. And, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, the honest reader can judge from these statements that we certainly require good works, since we teach that faith arises in repentance and is bound to increase in repentance. We place Christian and spiritual perfection in these matters, if repentance and faith grow together in repentance. The godly can understand this better than the adversary's teaching about contemplation or perfection. However, just as justification applies to faith, so also eternal life applies to faith. Peter says, obtaining the outcome or fruit of your faith, the salvation of your souls, 1 Peter 1, nine. For the adversaries confess that the justified are children of God and co-heirs of Christ. Afterward, because works please God on account of faith, they earn other bodily and spiritual rewards, for there will be distinctions in the glory of the saints. Here the adversaries reply that eternal life is called a reward and that, therefore, it is merited in a wholly deserving way by good works. We reply briefly and plainly. Paul calls eternal life a gift, because by the righteousness presented for Christ's sake, we are made at the same time sons of God and co-heirs of Christ. As John says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Augustine says, as also do many others who follow him, God crowns his gifts in us. Elsewhere it is written, your reward is great in heaven. If these passages seem to conflict for the adversaries, they themselves may explain them. But the adversaries are not fair judges. They leave out the word gift. They also leave out the primary teachings of the entire matter. Further, they select the word reward and twist its meaning not only against scripture, but also against the common use of language. In this way, they conclude that because our works are called a reward, there should be a price paid for eternal life. They assume they are worthy of grace and life eternal and do not stand in need of mercy or of Christ as mediator or of faith. This logic is altogether new. We hear the term reward and are supposed to conclude that there is no need of Christ as mediator, or of faith having accents to God for Christ's sake, not for the sake of our works. Who does not see that these are unrelated sentences wrongly joined together? We do not argue about the term reward. We argue whether good works are of themselves worthy of grace and of eternal life, or whether they please only on account of faith, which takes hold of Christ as mediator. Our adversaries not only attribute this to works, namely, that they are worthy of grace and of eternal life, but they also state falsely that works have surplus merits. The adversaries maintain that these merits can be granted to other people to justify them, as when monks sell to others to justify them, as when, when monks sell to others the merits of their orders. They heap up these freakish ideas in the matter of Chrysippus especially about the one word reward. It is called a reward, therefore, works are the price paid for it. So works please by themselves and not for the sake of Christ as mediator. And since one has more merits than another, some have surplus merits. Those who have earned them can sell them to others. Stop, reader. 
you don't have the whole chain of arguments, for certain sacraments of this purchase must be added, the hood is placed upon the dead. The blessings brought to us in Christ and the righteousness of faith have been hidden by such additions. We are not trying to start a needless word battle about the term reward. But it is a great, exalted, and very important matter about where Christian hearts can find true and certain comfort. It is about whether our works can give consciences rest and peace, whether we are to believe that our works are worthy of eternal life, or whether that is given to us for Christ's sake. These are the real questions regarding these matters. If consciences are not rightly taught about these, they can have no certain comfort. However, we have stated clearly enough that good works do not fulfill the law, that we need God's mercy, that through faith we are accepted by God, that good works, be they ever so precious, even if they were the works of St. Paul himself, cannot bring rest to the conscience. It makes sense that we are to believe that we receive eternal life through Christ by faith, not because of our works or of the law. But what do we say of the reward that Scripture mentions? That the adversaries will admit that we are regarded righteous through faith because of Christ, and that good works please God because of faith, we will not afterward argue much about the term reward. We confess that eternal life is a reward. It is something due because of the promise, not because of our merits. For the justification has been promised, which we have previously shown to be properly God's gift. To this gift, the promise of eternal life has been added, according to Romans 8.30. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. Here belongs what Paul says, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me. 2 Timothy 4.8 The justified are due the crown because of the promise. Saints should know this promise, not that they may labor for their own profit, for they ought to labor for God's glory. But saints should know it, so they may not despair in troubles. They should know God's will. He desires to aid, to deliver, and to protect them. Although the perfect hear the mention of penalties and rewards in one way, the weak hear it another way. The weak labor for the sake of their own advantage. Yet the preaching of rewards and punishments is necessary. God's wrath is set forth in the preaching of punishments. This applies to the preaching of repentance. Grace is set forth in the preaching of rewards. Just as scripture in the mention of good works often embraces faith, for it wishes righteousness of the heart to be included with the fruit. So sometimes it offers grace together with other rewards. We find this in Isaiah 58, 8-14, and frequently in other places in the prophets. We also affirm what we have often said, that although justification and eternal life go along with faith, nevertheless good works merit other bodily and spiritual rewards and degrees of reward. And we will pick that up again tomorrow evening. We join now in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise your fathomless mercy with which you take pity on sinful men. All the prophets and apostles preach this to us in your holy word. Let our hope not be put to shame when we pray to you for all who suffer at this time, for, behold, the evil foe has become mighty, and the great ones of this world rule often with unrighteousness. O God, who in former times caused your saints to overcome injustice, Strengthen also today all who stand in need of your help. Grant that all prisoners of war held as slaves and sacrifices of earthly wrath may return to their homes. Stand by all refugees and homeless people and be their justice. Be a father to the widows and orphans with your strong protection. Go through bars and fences to those who are imprisoned for the sake of your name. Strengthen them for a good witness. 
and let them not waver in the confession of your name. Teach us through their example and the example of so many holy martyrs to be ever watchful of the confession of your son's name. Let us not be put to shame when the evil foe lays his hand on us. But if it is your will that we be persecuted for confessing Jesus as our Lord and only Savior, then support us in your grace that we may withstand all trials and grant us peaceful rest. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, through your prophet Jonah, you continued the prophetic pattern of teaching your people the true faith and demonstrating through miracles your presence in creation to heal it of its brokenness. Grant that your church may see in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the final end times prophet, whose teaching and miracles continue in your church through the healing medicine of the gospel and the sacraments. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.